Uh, hello, respected viewers. Uh, dear Gwit, I should say, Cornish at all to. Um, Akara, right. So, Gora Mahaga for listening, and that's about the extent of my Gwelega. Uh, uh, this is about uh, Irish nationalism after 1798, because there'd been a request from someone. So I'm not going to go that far. I might go up to the famine. People could write uh, uh, whole libraries on this, but I'll just give you a potted history of a few things I, c I can pick out of my head. Um, anyway, so uh, after the 1798 rebellion, well, the Act of Union was passed in 1800, having been earlier rejected by our all Protestant Parliament, which uh, represented uh, the landlord class, and that was that. So we pay became by the United Kingdom. Now, as uh, the Earl of Eldon, the, the Lord High Chancellor of Great Britain, once said that uh, representative government is the opposite of the system of government in this country, talking about the UK. By the time he said that, Ireland, we were part of the UK. So we had two members of Parliament for each uh, county and two for each borough, some from Dublin University, blah, 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 part of the Parliament of the United Kingdom. And the Church of Ireland's archbishops were in, in, in the House of Lords and some of its bishops. And that was that. So the Napoleonic Wars were still raging at that stage. Um, but anyway, uh, so some people were against the Union. What was majority opinion? We don't really know. Um, fascinating, the Orange Order um, opposed the Act of Union, something that very few Orange men would realise these days, because they thought it would lead to Catholic emancipation. So the, the Protestant minority in Ireland, uh, well, they didn't want to share power with the Catholic minority, majority, by and large. The one thing is, supposing Ireland, supposing we're part of the UK, then there'll be a Protestant minority. So maybe the Irish Protestants will say, oh, right, well, we can we can share power with uh, the Catholics in Ireland. Pitt the Younger was prime minister at the time. That was certainly his view. Incidentally, in Ireland, we never had a prime minister. Um, that was fascinating. We had no sort of head of government. We had an understudy to the head of state. We had the Viceroy, also called the Lord Lieutenant, um, living living Dublin Castle, latterly in Phoenix Park, was now Oras on Uchteron. So the Lord Chancellor of Ireland, or the Irish Chancellor Exchequer, the Speaker of our House of Commons, these were some of the um, doyens of our political scene. But anyway, so uh, New Year's Day, 1800, we became part of the UK. And the various articles, the Act of Union, and our, our currency, the Irish pound, was got rid of. We became part of the Sterling Zone. Um, there was another thing. One of the Act of Unions, the Act of Union, one of the articles said, there should be one united Church of England and Ireland, one united Protestant Church. I should say. Um, so that was that. Um, but some people thought this is an absolute calamity and they had to stop it. So Robert Emmett was one of those, and I've spoken elsewhere about his failed rebellion in 1803. So Michael Dwyer was fighting the Wicklow Mountains, so uh, fighting an, an insurgent uh, campaign, hit and run, and somehow he negotiated via, via intermediaries with the Crown authorities, and it was agreed that if he surrendered, he would be permitted to take ship for the United States. So um, the uh, authorities only par partly kept their bargain. So he was not prosecuted, not um, uh, jailed or harmed, but he was sent by ship to Australia. He was not allowed to go to America. And there he lived as a free settler in Australia. So the um, uh, authorities were quite keen to end this rebellion. So that was an uh, exceptional lenity for the time, given that people had only been tangentially involved uh, in the revolt earlier. Some had been executed. Um, so um, anyway... Uh, the situation really calmed down and we got on with fighting the, the, the Napoleonic Wars. Um, obviously, we men were volunteering for the British Army, the Royal Navy and so forth. It was very much a time of, of a racialism. One of the words on the um, United Irishman's flag was equality. And they had the Phrygian cap on that. Phrygia was a, an, a state in ancient Greece. It's in, in Asia Minor, therefore now Turkey. For some reason, that was a symbol of liberty. The French revolutions often wore it. You'll see it on the um, Argentine coat of arms, for instance. But um, it was a completely inegalitarian age. Um, it was a time of, of, of racialism. So it was a very prejudiced era. Now, the United Irishmen were trying to get us to rise above that. So in that, in that wise, they are praiseworthy. Um, anyway, so the Napoleonic Wars came to an end. By this time, we had the Irish Peace Preservation Force. That's to say, our police force. And only Protestants were allowed to join it to begin with. Um, about the Act of Union, perhaps I ought to have said that the Catholic Church had been in favour of this, thinking that the, the Catholic emancipation would follow hard on its heels. But um, so and then Pitt the Younger was trying to get this through Parliament. George III was dead against saying that we would violate his Protestant succession oath. And he took that very seriously indeed to uphold the supremacy of the Church of Ireland, the Church of Scotland and the Church of England. 
there was no Church of Wales, it was called the Church of Wales, uh, so the Church of England in when it was in Wales. Um, now, he couldn't block it, and monarchs since Queen Anne had always signed uh, bills, turned them into acts, no matter how much they detested them. So I don't think there's any doubt that George III would have signed this, but he was able to mobilise opinion, use a very considerable sway to persuade people to vote against it, because, of course, he had these very extensive and untrammelled powers of patronage to promote and demote. All these jobs were, were in his gift, so it didn't happen. And there was a lot of opposition in Parliament to it anyway. So um, that was that. So uh, in order to hold lots of public offices, well, to be a member of Parliament, a judge, and things like that, and an army officer, lots of things, you had to take an oath which was designed to be incompatible with Catholicism, to say that you disbelieved in transubstantiation, things like that. A lot of it was meant to be um, um, distasteful to dissenters, that's to say Protestants outside the established churches, as in Methodists, for instance, or Baptists. But uh, then the Indemnity Act had continually delayed and de delayed the implementation of that, of this Test and Corporation Act against um, uh, dissenters. Anyway, um, so uh, Daniel O'Connell came along, he was born in Kerry in 1775, into a very affluent land handing family. Of course, owing to the 1704 Act to prevent the further growth of the popery, we weren't permitted um, primogenitor inheritance. So estates were to be divided equally between the sons. The idea is that a very substantial estate would be, would be diminished and diminished till it was almost um, worthless. Um, but you'll say, oh, that's, that's gavel kind. Oh, that's terrible. Um, but then if, if, if one son gets it, what do the others do? Okay, they have to find other jobs, be laborers or whatever. Um, so uh, there we are. But uh, they had some Protestant friends who nominally held it for them and allowed them to effectively control the land. So a very notable figure there in Kerry. His family was smuggling things from France. Not that the items were contraband as such, but just it was tax evasion. So a very affluent chap who'd studied in France and been uh, appalled by the French Revolution, by, by the violence of it. And he said that you can't build liberty with the, with the cement of blood. But of course, governments use, they, they kill as well to uphold their authority. He wasn't actually a pacifist. There's, um, he's an absolutely scintillating character. And his um, uh, uncle, Morris Hunting Cap O'Connell, he'd um, been in charge of the Irish regiment in, in the French army. So some Irish Jacobites had gone there abroad in the French army. If they fought and defeated the United Kingdom, the Jacobite claimant might be able to come back to Ireland. But from the 1760s, the Pope no longer recognised the Jacobite claimant. And anyway, Morris um, Hunting Cap O'Connell found the French Revolution so uh, loathsome that he offered his services to the ailing King George III. Quite a turnaround. Anyway, so uh, there had been a Catholic committee in uh, the 1790s um, pushing for reform. Could we have uh, Catholic... Um, Catholic Relief Act, yes, what we did, emancipation, could we have complete equality, if not something close to it, and so there was another organisation that uh, was pushing for this. Um, so there was the Catholic Association, to begin with, it was a small association, charging, I think, um, uh, was it um, a guinea a month or something, which was a huge sum of money at the time, it was one pound and one shilling. Remember, we had pounds, shillings and pence till the early 70s. Pounds divided into 20 shillings, the shilling was divided into 12 pence. They're halfpennies, as in half pennies, they're even farthings. So, but a pound had serious purchasing power. Um, uh, like, like you could buy a good horse for five pounds, for instance. Um, anyway, so Daniel O'Connell said, no, this mustn't be just for the elite, the few Catholics in the professions and so on. We've got to um, open it up to the masses. And it was not an age of mass politics. Most people um, knew nothing about politics. They hardly read newspapers. A lot of people couldn't read at all. Uh, a lot of people only spoke Irish, couldn't speak English. And O'Connell, fascinatingly, though he was brought up bilingual and then became fluent in French, he uh, only campaigned in, in um, uh, the English language. So uh, he said, let's have a, a penny a month from each household. We'll call it Catholic rent. It's not rent if you're willing to do it. And the clergy, they helped to collect this. So um, it became a mass movement and he addressed these so-called monster meetings with up to 100,000 people coming. There was very little entertainment. A lot of people couldn't go to the theatre. They're not theatres in some of these country areas. So he became uh, became more and more popular um, in the late 1820s. So he wanted um, as, as close to equality as we could get. And the authorities uh, started to become alarmed. But he said, no use of force will be completely lawful, law abiding. He was a barrister practicing on the, the, the Munster circuit. Famous is that, that Colin Bourne murder case where he was defending, but he did manage to save his client unfortunately. 
Um, so I remember reading a press report at the time saying that uh, O'Connell is the George Washington or the Simon Bolivar of Ireland. Remember, Simon Bolivar had just led many of these um, Latin American countries to independence, had them break away from from Spain. Now, um, uh, O'Connell did not want to sever our relationship with Great Britain completely. As we're going to come on to later, he wanted to um, repeal the Act of Union and go back to having the Kingdom of Ireland, but this time with the Catholic majority in charge, because not because he was um, anti-Protestant, I don't think, but uh, saying, well, we are the majority and it's right that we would have most of the uh, political say. Um, Anyway, so the Tory party was in government most of this time, I and mean, Pitt was largely regarded by Sir Tory Pitt the Younger, um, succeeded by Spencer Percival, who was assassinated. Well, um, obviously, um, and then um, there was Lord Liverpool in office for a long time. Uh, and the Earl of Liverpool, who found this issue so divisive, Catholic emancipation, should we relax some of the anti-Catholic legislation, that he had to suspend collective cabinet responsibility on this issue, and only on this issue. So collective cabinet responsibility is everybody in the cabinet must publicly speak up for governmental policy, even if you disagree with it. However, if you, if you find that policy unconscionable, then you must resign from the cabinet and occasionally their resignations on point principle. So on other issues, whatever, raising income tax, even if you dislike that, you've got to say, I agree with this, this is good. If, you, if you're not willing to do that, you're out of the cabinet. Or if you publicly denounce the government, you will get sacked and dismissed by somebody who has some, some sort of unity and discipline. Um, so they all had to say, yes, we believe in fighting against France till victory, or things like that. Or, um, yes, we should transport people to Australia for sedition. But in this issue, they could speak their mind. And within the cabinet, the two factions are known as Catholics and Protestants. Okay, a Protestant meant that uh, you did not want Catholic emancipation. A Catholic means you agree to Catholic emancipation. They weren't actually Roman Catholics, because you could only get into Parliament um, if you took an oath which was designed to be uh, unacceptable to someone of the Roman Catholic faith. So, um, and the, the public, collective cabinet responsibility has only been suspended twice since in 1975 by Harold Wilson for that referendum on uh, staying part of the European economic community. And then again in 2016 for the UK's referendum on uh, leaving the European Union. So um, uh, George Canning continued that policy. An Irishman, though London born, died, uh, died in office after only 119 days. He breathed his last at Chiswick House, London. Ironically, the very same room where Charles James Fox, in an illustrious wig, had also given up his spirit. So, so Lord Goderich was briefly, um, uh, briefly Prime Minister as well. Um, OK, so um, things were getting out of hand. It was unmanageable. Was it going to be a pre-revolutionary situation? And people were angry about other issues like tithes, paying taxes at the Church of Ireland and... Uh, 20 percent probably 15 percent of the people were actually communicants of the church of ireland presbyterians methodists baptists and so forth those dissenting protestants they had to pay it too now all right the church of ireland did provide some services generally like orphanages um schools but you're usually an anglican if you went to one of those uh, trinity college dublin the only university in ireland um hospitals for the most part it was for them it was for the clergy and the thing is the church of ireland they had a priest in every single parish in ireland even if there were no protestants it was ridiculous there's a small place in the Berry peninsula called connor i don't know if there were a couple of protestants but they had a church of ireland clergyman there in the 19th century um so it was the only job to have all right money high social status loads of free time almost no work um so uh, people resent it for all sorts of reasons, as you can see. The Catholic Church was becoming more confident. Um, the uh, government was parleying with the Catholic Church a great deal more. A lot of uh, churches, schools, uh, mon uh, you know, convents, monasteries, abbeys and priories date from this era. So we're becoming uh, a little bit wealthier um, as a community. And so finally came to the Clare by-election. So William Vasey Fitzgerald, he was going to be appointed to some cabinet position. And the rule was at the time that um, if, if someone was appointed to the cabinet, this was an office of profit out of the crown, and he had to submit himself to his electors again to see if they were going to vote him in again. It was, it was something that was only phased out in the 1920s. Um, so, like, I don't know, Church had to do this a bit when he was, when he was a young um, MP. Uh, and... I don't know, we're important, like Sir Robert Peel was MP for Cashel, for instance. Remember, there was a tiny electorate, only people who owned serious amounts of um, uh, property with a high rentable value were, were permitted to vote. So what, what, what was to be done? And the Duke of Wellington, um, 
he had uh, initially been against this, and so had Robert Peel. Robert Peel was slammed by some as Orange Peel in Ireland, as in he was too partial to the Orange Order. Um, and the Orange Order was a sort of a maybe lower middle class organisation at the time. It's only later that was co-opted by uh, the grandees and aristocrats had to get these top, top, top positions in it. And there was quite a, a bit of agrarian uh, violence. Um, white boyism, the Steel Boys, the Pipo Day Boys, their, their violence had diminished. It wasn't as severe as the 1790s. There was a new movement coming up called the, the Ribbon Men. A ribbonism, as in wearing a ribbon around your hat for identification at night time. No street lighting, of course, and going and, you know, destroying the property of an unpopular landlord or somebody who'd moved in to take over an evicted uh, cottage, things like that. So, um, anyway, uh, April 1829, the government changed its mind in this one, and Peel wrote to the Duke of Wellington saying he thought that granting um, uh, Catholic emancipation was dangerous, but not doing so was even more dangerous, otherwise there might be a revolution. So they had to um, allow people to let off steam, and they had to give the Catholic uh, majority justice. So it was passed. Anyway, that was that. Celebrated, the centenary was celebrated, and obviously 1929 by big parades by the Irish army in Dublin. So, but the franchise was changed. So yes, we could vote, but um, they raised the uh, threshold at which the right to vote was granted. They increased it hugely. So we'd had something like 200,000 Catholic voters um, uh, We were um, in 1829, um, but it was down to about 30,000. The change was we now could be elected to parliament because Daniel O'Connell stood against Vasey Fitzgerald and won and stood against him twice more and won all three times. And obviously Clare's got a very high Catholic majority. Um, you know, at that time would have been 90% Catholic. Of the electorate, not all of them would have been Catholic. Another thing I can point out is um, the, the, of the electorate, probably, you know, more than 10% were doing Protestants because they tended to be affluent. Uh, so, incidentally, William Vasey Fitzgerald was actually sympathetic to Daniel O'Connell's cause, despite him being a Protestant himself. Um, Anyway, the Great Reform Act came along in 1832. That applied to us as much as ever anywhere else, but I shan't go into that. Uh, and then uh, O'Connell had suggested that's all he wanted, that he didn't want to sunder the Union, but he very quickly changed his tune. So no sooner was the Great Reform Act passed than he wanted another change, and he really made his mark in their House of Commons, and he managed to form an alliance with the Whigs. There were Tories and Whigs, but some faction of the Whigs was very advanced, largely split off when as the Radicals, and he had a good relationship with them. Um, so he found the Repeal uh, Association, or better known as the Loyal National Repeal Association, for the repeal of the Act of Union. So um, wanted to uh, get rid of the Act of Union, go back to what we had in the 1790s and before, so-called Grattan's Parliament. Incidentally, H Henry Grattan, it was in being, he was the figure who was uh, the dominant one within our Parliament in the late 19th century, and saying, oh, well, he was such a patriot, the so-called Patriot Party in Ireland. He was also an MP for a constituency in England. He was in the UK Parliament at the same time. And there's Henry Flood, another one who led the charge against uh, the Act of Union in 1800. And when it was passed, he nevertheless got himself elected for a constituency in England and was over there. So he wasn't that against it. He accepted the new dispensation. His son, Henry Flood, also wrote, well, wrote a very... Um, uh, loyal biography of his father. Um, so uh, where were we after the two um, Henrys? But obviously the crucial difference was you won't, we won't completely turn about the clock because if we if we became the Kingdom of Ireland once more, uh, the Catholic majority, we would be in the saddle because, you know, it was like 75% of the population. Um, now, even with the franchise and we, us being poor on average than Protestants, would we have 50% of the vote cl close to it? Um, and obviously being a bit sitting in Parliament too, not just having the right to vote. Um, so the, that was the strange thing is, yes, there was established established church in every European country and membership of the national church was necessary for full membership of the nation and people would be discriminated against if they did not conform themselves to the uh, state religion. But Ireland, we were almost unique in being a country where the uh, majority denomination was not the state religion. Um, Anyway, so the Loyal National Repeal Association, they um, continued the tactics trailblazed by uh, the Catholic Association and had a fairly broad appeal as well, often working with the Catholic clergy and meeting with the um, approbation of the hierarchy. So um, getting small donations from many people so people feel they had ownership of this, they had a share in it, and huge meetings going around the country. Uh, so uh, O'Connell and his co-agitators were... Um, 
energizing uh, the population, was uh, galvanized by his uh, spellbinding and magnificent oratory. Um, and that's why his hometown, Caja Daniel, was called that, the, the, um, the Daniel's place. And that their headquarters in, in, in um, Dublin called Reconciliation Hall, as in we were reconciled with each other, and indeed Great Britain, good fences make good neighbors. But they still prefer the monarchy, and even singing um, God Save the King sometimes then, or saying repeal and no separation. Uh, but anyways, beginning to run out of steam in the late 1830s, and they were saying, no, no, very few people in Great Britain agree to this. There was a Litchfield House compact when he made an agreement with some of the Whigs and radicals, an alliance against the Tories, and the Tories were um, seemed to be very much the other way. By this time, the Orange Order had changed its tune on on the Act of Union, and so they seemed to think it was a good thing, and were four square behind it, and not willing to budge an inch on that. Now, the Orange Order, well, is confusing because there were several rival organisations with the word Orange in the name. Um, and then one of them was briefly outlawed. So it's very difficult to trace apost apostolic succession, if you will, to through the Orange Order. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was that. It's sort of, sort of a charity. People are members of the Orange Order. There were only men in those days wearing orange collarettes, often inaccurately called sashes, and parading around the 12th of July um, to remember, commemorate William of Orange, who became King William III, giving people Sweet William, that plant in honour of him, or indeed orange lilies and things like that. And um, they take an oath of loyalty to defend the monarchy, being Protestant. If they change a Catholic, they wouldn't defend them. It's not an oath to the Act of Union. OK, some Orangemen don't seem to, to grasp that distinction. Um, so uh, obviously a Protestant only society and they associate that with parliamentary government. Uh, OK, so uh, in the, the 1830s, he was not he was not making progress with that. Unfortunately, everybody knew who he was, the uncrowned King of Ireland. I remember another press report saying instead of people saying, God be with you, they say O'Connell be with you. Uh, so his house in London, it was Fiveside Brown's Hotel. I think his Albemarle Street was a well-known place of visitation for um, for radicals of all sorts. He was also against slavery. He wanted equality with the Jewish community. So he was an advocate of human rights. And I can't remember whether there's some doggerel against him by some bigot saying, um, scum of an Irish bog, um, ruffian, coward, demagogue, as in there they were, uh, castigating um, O'Connell. Um so into the 1740s, and some people are growing frustrated with what O'Connell is doing. Um, now, uh, yeah, Protestants in the North were very much mostly uh, for the Union by this stage. And remember, OK, there were quite a few repeal um, members of Parliament. There were also Tories and Whigs in Ireland who were, the Tories started to call themselves Conservatives. The um, uh, Liberals didn't, sorry, the Whigs didn't call themselves Liberals to the 1850s. Um, anyway, there was a, a Protestant preacher called uh, Roaring Hannah. Uh, who was obviously mostly thundering like an Old Testament prophet, prophet about Christianity. But uh, then he also, he also turned his mind to politics and said that he wanted to keep the union. Um, and this, by this time, Belfast it was growing fast and coming close to Dublin and population. Industry was starting up. The Industrial Revolution had come to Ireland and not just linen looms and all the rest of it, other factories. And so uh, he said, uh, Roaring Hannah said, look at Belfast Har Harbour and be a repealer if you can. I mean, would you really want to repeal the Act of Union when it's gone into this prosperity? I say prosperity, but most people were living in poverty, certainly by modern standards. Some children didn't have shoes even in winter, so people had barely enough to eat. But uh, you've got to remember that um, semi-starvation was the norm in every country until the 19th century, or even into the 20th century, we don't have to forget just how lucky we have it. Um, all these labour-saving devices and all that. Hello there, Diane Malloy. So I'm talking about Irish nationalism in the 1840s now. Um, so some of O'Connell's young followers became frustrated. They felt that he was like too grandfatherly, feeble, toothless, he was not delivering the goods, and it was too dictatorial. The movement is too built around one person's personality. And in fact, uh, he was liberated. He was feeble towards the uh, UK uh, authorities. Um, he was increasingly um, religious and some people felt that his conspicuous Catholicism was putting off some Protestants. He, uh, he actually said um, the uh, chief distinction between Englishmen and Irishmen is that Englishmen are Protestant and Irishmen are not. So saying that we're not Protestant, where does that leave the 25% or more of our population that's Protestant? They feel excluded. And of course there are English Catholics, just not very many. And so that's why you want repeal to do what? To make it a Catholic confessional state? Now, 
I don't want that. But you could say, well, that would still make more sense and be fairer than the other way around when this small minority of Protestants had their uh, religious denomination as the state uh, religion. Um, it's a time of rising nationalism in various countries. The Italian nationalist movement is get, was getting going. Um, likewise, in Germany, German unification was going, as well as Il Risorgimento in Italy. Uh, and Belgium had become an independent country in 1830, partly with the blessing of London. Um, where else? It was, there were nationalist stirrings in Poland. Um, Greece had recently broken away from the Ottoman Empire, partly with British assistance, Lord Byron going out there to fight, but dying at Messalonghi of an illness, though. And they seen, we saw all these Latin American republics where almost everybody's a Catholic, um, breaking away and becoming uh, independent countries. Um, so there was also fairly high emigration out of Ireland, people sailing abroad mostly to live in the United States. Hello, do I know Martin Travellers and Ballas Slow? No, I've never been to Ballas and Slow. I don't know why you're asking, Phase Rampage. To a lesser extent, people going to Canada, which is then known as British North America. Very few to South Africa or, or Australia. And remember, um, people who committed a crime could be sentenced to a punishment worse than death. Transportation to Australia, going to Botany Bay, that's Sydney, that colony called New South Wales, possibly Van Diemen's Land. We now call it Tasmania, as in Abel Tasman. Um, good evening. I hope all is well. Yes, straight white British Protestants. I'm top hole because um, I'm a Martin and a traveller. I see. Uh, phased. So back to the topic in hand. So some people um, were called the Young Islanders and they split off his movement. They grew frustrated with Daniel O'Connell um, as they felt that um, uh, he was too moderate and his softly, softly approach was not paying dividends. Um, and uh, they looked back to his record and remember, he remembered the yeomanry in 1798, as in there were, there were cavalry, part-time soldiers, do your ordinary job as a barrister, but military training, you know, on the weekend sometimes, and if there was a, to have to fight at home, fight on horseback. Yeomanry didn't have to serve overseas, so he'd been he'd been against um, the uh, United Irishman, but he was de he was definitely a monarchist as well, Daniel O'Connell. So uh, it represented a number of different seats, including um, uh, County Cork later, um, Dublin City. Um, anyway, he'd wanted a to hold a meeting at uh, Tara. Um, which is just north of Dublin, you know, near, near um, Drogheda, because that was the seat of the ancient high kings. And the authorities outlawed that one. They thought it was too worrisome. He was regarded as a seditionist by um, uh, some of the hardline loyalists. Um, but, you know, there are some people in the, uh, Lib in the Liberal Party, or Whigs, I should say, or even Tories who were repealers, who were Tories in every other way, and said, we could just go back to what we have in the 1790s, but OK, the Catholic majority be in charge. Almost nobody talking about a republic at that stage, a complete separation. Uh, O'Connor was definitely a monarchist. It was difficult to conceive of a government without a, without a monarchy because almost every country in Europe had a monarchy. And the Catholic Church was deeply um, suspicious of republics, thought that they were necessarily inimical to uh, Catholicism. Um, remember, they'd had that with the French Revolution. They'd had that various um, satellites of France republic set up in Italy, the Cisalpine Republic, the Roman Republic, but they hadn't lasted kissing time, of course. Um, anyway, so the Tara meeting was banned. So then he scheduled one for Clontarf. Remember Clontarf just north of Dublin. Um, and that's where in 1014, Brian Baru, High King of Ireland, had defeated the Danes, repelled the invaders. That was that, although he was slain right at the end of the battle. Brian Baru, who's originally King of Munster. And there were resonances for some between Ireland's situation in the 1840s and in 1014, as in this is a way we could repel the invader as in this case, the English, not the Danes. Um, and um, uh, that was that. So repeal the Act of Union. And the, the government did not like the connotations of um, staging a huge rally um, there. So he was, it was called off and he was persuaded, well, he was persuaded to cancel it because they, they demanded he did. Some young hotheads were saying, no, go away, define them. Phys physical force, if necessary. Please explain the US meaning of Scotch-Irish to folk the side of the pond. OK, so a lot of Scottish people came to Ireland in the in the uh, 17th century. And remember, the Reformation in Scotland was in the 1560s. So Scotland became a mostly Protestant country, about 90 percent Protestant, just a few Catholics on the West Coast. Um, and um, I won't get into why they came, but they settled in some of these northeast counties of Ireland. Our northern province is called Ulster, so nine counties in Ulster. But the counties where they settled and became a majority would have been Antrim, Down, Armagh. Derry or Londonderry, if you prefer, um, Tyrone, that's about it. 
Um, there were also English settlers as well, Welsh ones as well. Again, almost all Protestant. So they're known as Scotch-Irish. The Church of Scotland is a Presbyterian one, as in it, it, it doesn't have um, um, uh, priests. It doesn't like that word. It uses the word minister. Priest, that's like the Catholic Church, will say minister. Um, we don't believe in ordination. We don't believe in apostolic succession. And uh, we um, are ruled, ruled by uh, elders. Presbyteros in ancient Greek is an elder. Uh, we don't have bishops. Uh, Episcopus being bishop in, 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 in ancient Greek. So that's why. And the Presbyterian Church um, in Ireland just was copying the Church of Scotland in its way it was governed. So um, every man who went to the church in those days was allowed to vote for elders as representatives. They, and they would hold uh, synods every so often, sorry, general assembly so often. And there'd be some ministers go along, had a special religious education. And then there'd be elders as an elected men to go along. So fairly democratic. Eventually, obviously, women were allowed to vote for the elders as well. An elder could be a man or a woman these days. So the laity, the ordinary churchgoers, they're represented the general assembly, not those, just those with a special theological education. And the, 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 the ministers and that. And they don't believe there's an intermediary between God and man. That, you know, if you have a priest in the Catholic Church or the Church of England, there's some ceremonies which can only be performed by a priest and don't count if they're not performed by a priest. Whereas the um, the uh, Presbyterians don't believe that. So that's what Scotch Irish is. They be speaking English or sometimes Scots. But the Scots language or dialect, if you prefer, uh, really is almost the same as English. You just change one word, so one letter in most words, you change the vowel sometimes. Got a bit of sui generis vocabulary. So quite a distinctive community. And at first, the um, uh, Scots in Ulster and the English in Ulster didn't completely get along, but they largely merged and intermarried English, Welsh and Scots there. And being Protestant was quite important to them. They all spoke English. Remember, the, so the native Irish, the people who were living in that part of Ireland prior to the 17th century, we were described as native Irish. We're Catholic almost without exception, mostly speaking the Irish language. The very east of Ulster, like say Carrick Fergus or Down Patrick, people might have spoken English. And that was that. Um, so then in the in the 18th century, a lot of these Scotch Irish people started moving to America, particularly the southern some of the southern parts, let's say like Virginia, Georgia, North Carolina, and so on. That's why um and George Washington said, Oh, I'll take my last stand of my, my um, Scotch Irish ancestry. So there we are. Okay, so back to the 1840s. So Thomas Davis was one of the leading lights of, of Young Ireland. Uh, so he's born um, in uh, North Cork to a Welsh father and Irish mother. His father was a surgeon in the British Army and a number of other uh, leading figures um, like uh, James Clark Luby, um, John O'Connor Power. I'm just trying to think of some of the other guys. Um, uh, Charles Kickham. There'd be any more. There'd be uh, John uh, Mitchell. And who's that, that guy um, from the north, the son of a Presbyterian minister? I forget his name. It'll come to me. Um, and uh, they formed Young Ireland. And uh, Davis, he founded a newspaper called The Nation. And they're also a little bit worried about the about the uh, decline of the Irish language. And these guys were um, mostly um, Protestants. They're often from fairly well-to-do backgrounds. So many of these prominent people were the sons of Church of Ireland clergy, because I suppose they were highly educated people, um, but often living in the rural areas, not in Dublin. Uh, so um, anyway, they got their newspaper going. Although Thomas Davis, he died only about the age of 31, but he nevertheless left his mark on history, wrote that song, A Nation Once Again. When I was... Um, uh, how does it go, lad? I read of ancient free men of Greece and Rome who bravely stood three hundred three men, three hundred men and three men. I prayed I yet might see our fetters rent in twain, and Ireland, long a province, be a nation once again. And that's the refrain: a nation once again. The idea being Ireland, we can't be a nation if we're part of the United Kingdom. Must split from the United Kingdom, be completely separate, and then we will resume our status as a nation. Well, it's redolent of of, of Robert Emmett's uh, very truculent speech from the dock when Ireland takes her place amongst the nations of the world. Um, then and not till then, let my epitaph be written. I have done. So he said when on trial by Lord Norbury. Why were so many Anglo and Scots Protestants involved in Irish nationalism really strange? Yeah, good question. Well, it might not seem strange to them at the time. Often they thought they were the nation. Sometimes not quite aware what a big majority of the Catholic community was, because remember, till 1801, we had no censuses. Um, and where you live, if you live in County Down or Dublin, I think, but most people are Protestants because everybody around here is. Uh, and that was that. Um, what else? So, yeah, um, Gaelic nationalism hadn't got going. I use that advisedly. 
Gaelic nationalism, not Irish nationalism, having to link it to the Celtic past, to the semi-mythical past. Let's look back to before um, the 12th century and that the Irish language has to be a key part of it and that Catholicism is almost coterminous with Irish identity. That idea came in more and more through the 19th century. Another thing is that we weren't very industrialised. Um, you know, we're largely an agricultural country. We had a few manufacturers trading with Great Britain a little bit. But by the end of the 19th century, that had changed, certainly in Ulster. Trade with Great Britain mattered very much more. And with the empire, I remember it being the zenith, then at the zenith of the British Empire. Because the Catholic community, I suppose, were largely politically unconscious. Um, remember, it was only in 1870 that was compulsory. Uh, near, I don't speak Gaelic. Only 1870 was compulsory schooling. Until 1870... A lot of people didn't go to school for a single day. OK, and even those who did go to school would have might have had a very desultory education uh, taught in a hedge school and just be able to read to a very low level, uh, write their name and almost nothing else. So people just weren't very educated, very politically conscious. But um, the Protestant community being wealthier, have access to the best schools and the only university much sooner um, then they were just exposed to political ideas and were perhaps just more politically awake and articulate so there we are so um uh times change all right so uh where was i anyway so so he's cancelled that um uh clontarf meeting um but nevertheless he was arrested charged with sedition and imprisoned in richmond uh jail in in, in uh dublin doesn't exist anymore it's now some college rather just uh, south of the liffey near that um grand canal um, but he was acquitted, he was set free, and people were elated about this. Uh, the liberator, they'd called him because of Catholic emancipation, and they he was came out of prison, and he was a very wealthy man, so dressed up to the nines, going to get into his horse-drawn carriage to be dr driven away. He was pulled by many horses. People said, no, 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 we so adore you, and we so exalt you. We'll take away your horses, and we'll pull your horse-drawn carriage. So hundreds of men pulled his horse-drawn carriage through the streets of Dublin. Anyway, he was, whether he was very ill by this time, his strength was failing him. So he wanted to go off on a pilgrimage to Rome, possibly die in Rome, because um, most people get a bit more spiritual as they get older. But by this stage, he was more or less religiously obsessed. So he went off on his way to Rome, but he died in, in Genoa. His body was brought back. Or is it just part of it, the whole of it? He's buried in Glasnevin Cemetery under this huge um, sort of obelisk, but it does look like an ancient Irish round tower. That's why there's O'Connell Street in Dublin, which is the main drag in the whole country. I remember in the good old days when we had um, the Irish pound, a punt on the 20 note, there was a Daniel O'Connell, a doc you could call him. Um, so he had, he had married, he had several children, and uh, his sons followed him into politics as well, but none of them were anything like as distinguished as he was. It's a bit like Randolph Churchill says, nothing grows in the shadow of a great oak tree. Um, and you should read, oh, it was Tales of the Old Monster Circuit, no, that's by someone late. That's more and more of the Redmond political dynasty. So um, by this time, the uh, the famine was breaking out. People had other things to worry about. You know, William Smith O'Brien had been a Tory MP and a pillar of the establishment, had um, really uh, bolted to the other side. I thought that the union was horrific and that we must fight. And he started, the, the Young Ireland, as they called themselves, started the rebellion in Tipperary. But it ended with one um, inglorious little skirmish at Widow McCormick's uh, cabbage patch. So it's kind of farcical. So um, people were very demoralised. Um, hundreds of thousands of people were dying of, of starv starvation and uh, in our debilitated state, people were susceptible to diseases. These diseases you could fight off if you were well nourished, but were going to be fatal if uh, your um, constitution was enfeebled by uh, malnutrition, dying of famine, fever and so on. So how much of this mor morbidity is attributable to the famine and how much not? It's, it's debatable. Who were Anglo-Irish, native Irishmen of the Anglo faith or Ang newcomers? So Anglo-Irish, I don't know when this word originates, probably the late 19th century. That really means um, Irish people of fairly recent English ancestry. It might be Scots or Welsh too, but mainly English. And um, they would speak English as their main language, probably not speak Irish at all. And they'd be Protestants of some sort, almost almost invariably Church of Ireland. Um, I remember Brendan Bean in one of his plays, I don't know, is it the hostage saying, an Anglo-Irishman, what's that except a Protestant on a horse? And he talked about horse Protestants. So there'd be middle class, more likely upper middle class or even upper class. So a tiny percentage of our population, you know, Protestants of all stripes would have been 30% at most. So the Anglo-Irish really as, as, a, as a class thing would have been 5% of our population at most. So you find a lot of them in Dublin, some of the north, 
like the eastern counties of Ulster, like maybe down and Antrim, and then thinly scattered through the other counties, landlords, I suppose. Um, so oh, I don't want to go into this, but um, from the um, uh, 1880s on, there was legislation restricting what landlords could do and providing fi fair rent fixity of tenure if you were a tenant and things like that. Compensation for any improvements you may have made to the land, like digging, digging drainage ditches or building a barn or something. Um, and then the Wyndham Land Act, gradually compulsory purchase of estates. Tenants could vote that they wanted to, to get the estate back and some landlords just wanted to sell them anyway. So um, uh, that was that. So the Anglo-Irish uh, community, they were, uh, uh, by 1900, they'd rather diminished. Even though in Ireland, they tend not to own huge estates. The First World War killed them off, so I was literally getting killed at the front and death duties, big taxes on whatever their estates were. And really, they're really the, the wrong side of um, the troubled times right out of the First World War, 1916 and all that. So some of them stayed in Ireland, some of them left in Ireland, but that was that. Because Ireland, we were just very much part of the United Kingdom. People would know who the local grandee was. Some people would be talking the forelock. Some people would be rather resentful, hostile, partly because they're class warriors, but partly because they're anglophobic and or anti-Protestant and blah, blah, blah. Um, so uh, that was that. So the people would call themselves Irish. Yes, they were certainly Irish. I don't know if anyone actually called himself Anglo-Irish. Um, some people didn't accept them as being Irish. Anyway, so the uh, Repeal Association did not achieve its goals. It, um, the the radical MPs in Great Britain, they tended to concur with it. There was a considerable Irish community in Great Britain, um, some of whom were active in the Repeal Association in Great Britain. Um, and uh, Whigs, a few were sympathetic, Tories usually not. So that was that. So that was the first of this Irish nationalist uh, organisation of the, of the 19th century. The fascinating thing is... Um, in the 19th century, for only 48 of those 100 years, was there any nationalist party in Ireland at all? Now, they're always legal, but he didn't even found the uh, Repeal Association until 1829, if I've got that right. Um, and then later, there were other groups. The Home Government Association, founded in 1873, later called itself the Home Rule Party. OK, that's that for the moment. That's enough about Irish nationalism, sort of 1803, really, to about 19, 1846. Anglo-Protestants are the people of Bratton, Burke and Swift. We are the stock, greatest stocks of Europe and as much right the island as anyone. Yes, so said William Butler Yeats. I recognise the quotation in a speech about 1924 in the Shannon, as in our Senate, about divorce. We're no petty people, as he said. Well, Swift was born in Dublin to, Ir to two English parents. He could be regarded as Irish or English as, or both. I regard him as both. And they're more like to have typically English surnames like Grattan, Flood, Swift, all those ones. Um, so uh, and then, you know, like like Edmund Burke's calling himself a true Englishman. And now he was definitely Irish, would call himself Irish, too. But he thought that being English and Irish is compatible, even though he was born in Ireland and his family lived in Ireland for, for a few generations. Um, but, you know, from the 1870s, the cult, Gaelic cultural revival gets on. People say, no, we have to speak Irish. It's com it's like completely different. They can't be reconciled. That's enough for me. So please support me on Patreon or PayPal. Donate me on, pa on PayPal. George Callahan 79 at gmail.com. There's a silent G in Callahan. George Callahan 79 at gmail.com. Hire me for private lessons. Hire me as a tour guide in London. And uh, subscribe. Tell all your friends and neighbours. And uh, just request more videos. That's all. Oh, did Sinn Féin play a role in Irish independence or was it limited to only getting home rule? Well, Sinn Féin was only founded in um, about 1905 by Arthur Griffith. So they played a very considerable role from 1916 onwards. But Arthur Griffith's original idea for Sinn Féin was a dual monarchy. He looked to Hungary, Hungary's position within the Austrian Empire, and he even wrote The Resurrection of Hungary, a book about it. Um, and he also linked to the language and literature and so on. Uh, so what else was I going to point out about um, that? He wants, so he wanted there to be a king of Ireland, just like there's a king of Great Britain, and the one king to hold the two titles. That was his idea. But um, then the 1916 Easter Rising was described by a newspaper as a Sinn Féin rebellion, more or less accidentally calling it Sinn Féin. Of the seven signatories of the proclamation of the Irish Republic, only three of the seven were members of Sinn Féin, and none of them were particularly active in it. Um, but then it, then it became associated with that. Eamon de Valera, the only person who survived, the the only commander of, of the 1916 Rising who survived, he was then persuaded to join Sinn Féin, stand for Parliament. He was elected, he was made president of Sinn Féin, of the party. Uh, the initial people elected 
in sort of um, uh, retrospectively um, approving the rising were, well, was Count Plunkett, but he stood actually for the Liberty League, a party that um, has since uh, fallen out of remembrance and I think was a one-hit wonder. But uh, subsequently he uh, enrolled in the Sinn Féin party. So yes, Sinn Féin and the IRA then became largely synonymous. Um, like the, even the Irish tricolour, their songs calling it the Sinn Féin flag, like in Johnson's motor car, that song about the IRA. Or what's the other one? Um, there's one about the lonely woods of Upton, this IRA um, ambush on a train in Cork in 1921, wrong for the IRA. And it said um, that uh, many homes are filled with sadness and, pe and with pain for those who died at Upton for Sinn Féin. And uh, the IRA sometimes been called the Sinn Féin Volunteers and so forth. So they claim to be the oldest party in Ireland, but really the Conservative Party was founded by John Wilson Croker. Um, he's Irish, although it was founded in London, but existed in Ireland too. Um, the Whig Party, well, then Liberals, the Liberal Democrats don't stand in Northern Ireland, so you can't really say that they're a political party. Um, so Sinn Féin, it was originally the name of a magazine in Meath, Sinn Féin and the Old Castle Review, and then the political party took it, as in Ourselves Alone, and they had their own magazine, Clay Solish, as in The Sword of Light. All right, I'm uh, clocking off now. Goodbye.